Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the organizing committee and especially to Sky Downey for bringing me to Berlin this week. And also to John Tortorici, who has been a uh, kind of unofficial advisor and mentor uh, over the past few years. Uh, and I should add that uh, most of my research really got started through a Moss Exchange Program fellowship uh, a few years back. Uh, in fact, Sky and I lived on the same alley in Jerusalem, along with a few hundred cats. Uh, so that was a wonderful experience. Also got to take a seminar with Professor Ashheim. So my talk is entitled Morality, Nazi Ideology, and the Individual in the Third Reich, and I will be especially using the Wehrmacht as an example. In 1941, Harold Hoffman found himself advancing deep into the Soviet Union as a private in the 23rd Infantry Division, one of the more than three million men who took part in Hitler's grand scheme to secure Lebensraum for Nazi Germany. In his letters home, he openly discussed the atrocities he and his fellow soldiers committed against civilians and prisoners of war, including summary executions, rampant theft, the use of forced labor, and the destruction of entire villages. The conduct of his own side caused him deep misgivings. Quote, the enormous destruction, he wrote in one letter, the way in which our troops behave toward the civilian population and use them for slave labor, the views and opinions that one hears, all this makes me sick from sorrow and misery. Uh, to just give one example, um, on one occasion he described how he and his fellow comrades forced a woman to cook the last of her potatoes as her crying children looked on so the soldiers would have something extra to eat. Um, he and his comrades knew they had just condemned the family to a death sentence in the middle of winter. And he wrote to his mother about this and uh, was deeply troubled. Hoffman himself died in December of 1941 before he was able to reconcile his conflicting emotions about his participation in the war and the morality of his own actions. Um, however, most German soldiers, from what I've found, seem to have found ways to justify their actions and preserve their sense of personal integrity, even if they did occasionally, like Hoffman, experience moments of doubt. The case of Harold Hoffman feeds into the growing discussion surrounding a topic that previously received little attention. Uh, that is the question of morality in Nazi Germany. Some historians now argue that the Nazis were not amoral or self-consciously evil, as they have been habitually portrayed. Instead, they constructed their own self-contained ethical system that diverged sharply from Judeo-Christian norms. Nazi morality, as some scholars have called it, was grounded in a combination of Völkisch and social Darwinist principles that depicted all life as a struggle among distinct races, as well as the Jewish anti-race. Since the biological essence of the Aryan race was superior to that of its counterparts, everything that helped the Aryans in their struggle for existence was redefined as good, while anything that hindered them was now defined as evil. To date, the scholarship on morality in the Third Reich has typically involved one of two approaches. Some scholars, particularly Claudia Kuhns, have worked to demonstrate how the Nazis, disse Nazis disseminated their new ethic to the population, in her view, with great success. Another interpretation put forward by Raphael Gross, who uh, may or may not be here today, I'm not sure if he is, uh, highlights the ways in which the Nazis also redefined, modified, and appropriated existing ethical systems. Uh, historians who have shown an interest in the Nazi ethic, including the two mentioned here, have typically focused on the top-down process by which the regime imposed this new ethical system on the populace or tried to convince people to follow it. Uh, contributing to these discussions, my paper today engages with the question of how individuals navigated the moral world of the Third Reich and to what extent German society had made the transition from a more traditional Judeo-Christian value system to that of Nazi morality. I'd like to make two chief claims. 
Uh, the first one is that the moral discourse of the regime and the institutions that served it remained rife with ambiguities and contradictions throughout its time in power. As Claudia Kuhns has pointed out, Nazi leaders were determined not to rest until every man, woman, and child had adopted what Goebbels referred to as the, quote, radical revaluation of all values and expended considerable resources to this end. But Raphael Gross is equally correct to point out that the regime frequently injected more traditional moral reasoning into its arguments as well, evidently in the pragmatic recognition that no, not all Germans would make the transition to this moral system overnight. Uh, so I'd like to suggest that both of these approaches were in fact employed side by side and were not mutually exclusive. Uh, the end result was a jumble of mixed moral discourse coming from the top. The public was ultimately presented not with Nazi morality as the only officially sanctioned possibility, but with a confusing and often contradictory array of moral options upon which individuals could rely to justify their conduct or their compliance with the regime's goals. Um, and second, if we are to achieve a better understanding of morality in the Third Reich, scholars will need to investigate not just leaders and propaganda, but the moral choices made by individuals of all walks of life on the micro level, as well as the question of how they assess the morality of their own actions. What I seek to demonstrate today is that members of the German public, and I'll be using soldiers in particular, frequently took advantage of the regime's ambiguous moral discourse by mixing and matching whatever values or moral arguments seemed most salient to them personally. This relative freedom to choose whichever justifications they preferred, I argue, made it easier for individuals of different backgrounds and creeds to ultimately come to terms with their involvement in activities that furthered the regime's goals, all while maintaining the conviction that their personal decency remained intact. The road to compliance was paved not only with speeches by Nazi leaders, but with a thousand small rationalizations made by ordinary people every day. Um, so as I mentioned, the Wehrmacht will be my primary example, an institution populated by millions of young German men who were thoroughly exposed to the regime's indoctrination and who, particularly on the Eastern Front, willingly took part in many of the worst atrocities of the Nazi era. Uh, so first I'll talk about the top-down moral discourse within the Wehrmacht and then switch to the individual level with a few examples. Um, so what was the nature of moral discourse and the Wehrmacht as disseminated from the top down? Uh, well, as was the case with most institutions in the Third Reich, the army did not fail to transmit the tenets of Nazi morality to the men in its ranks. Following Hitler's purge of his SA rivals, uh, the Wehrmacht voluntarily adopted the infamous Oath of Loyalty in 1934, through which soldiers effectively abrogated moral responsibility for their actions to the Führer, who became a sort of conscience for them. Training manuals and instruction booklets were modified to accommodate the worldview of the new rulers. As the army defined them, quote, the uh, duties of the German soldier now centered on protecting, quote, the German Reich and fatherland, the people united in national socialism and their living space. The infamous criminal orders issued at the start of the campaign in the Soviet Union framed the invasion as an existential racial conflict in which the dictates of ordinary morality and military custom would no longer hold. Troops would not be prosecuted for crimes against civilians, commissars were to be shot on the spot, and prisoners treated as expendable. Uh, commanders at lower levels of the army hierarchy also issued draconian regulations throughout the conflict that prescribed the death penalty for even the smallest civilian infraction, denied food supplies to star starving prisoners of war, encouraged soldiers not to feel sympathy for the plight of Soviet non-combatants and cast Jews as special targets for violence. Um, so I, I'll skip over a couple of other examples, but uh, what they add up to is that the army encouraged soldiers to embrace the principles of Nazi morality and to justify their participation by defining themselves as members of a superior race, taking what belonged to it 
by the right of the stronger. Uh, however, and this is where the ambiguity comes in, uh, even as it sought to produce ideological hardened racial warriors, the Wehrmacht simultaneously continued to rely on traditional moral principles to motivate its men, perhaps in the recognition that not all of them would instantly adopt the new value system. According to the Army's 1940 training manual, soldiers were to remain, quote, upright, modest, God-fearing, and incorruptible, while safeguarding their honor through, quote, unimpeachable conduct. The same manual encouraged soldiers to obey international laws of war, refrain from killing prisoners, and respect the life and property of enemy noncombatants. Messaging at the start of Operation Barbarossa incorporated not only ideological arguments for the invasion, but a whole host of others that could appeal even to men who rejected Nazi values. The assault was variously described as a fully justified preemptive strike, as a noble act of liberation to save the long-suffering peoples of Eastern Europe from communism, or even as a religious crusade to restore Christian practice to an atheist land. The same propaganda organs that sought to shape soldiers into brutal racial warriors carried stories about how the Wehrmacht offered medical care to civilians, gave out candy to children, repaired damage to civilian homes, or reopened churches the Soviet regime had shuttered, uh, which is actually the subject of an article uh, that should be coming out relatively soon perhaps next year. Um, in the process, uh, they portrayed the army as a force for good and its personnel as honorable saviors by any traditional moral standard. Uh, Wehrmacht commanders frequently mixed injunctions to mercilessly, mercilessly suppress all opposition with orders to treat the mass of the Soviet population with dignity and respect. Um, and I'll skip over a couple of examples here for the sake of time. Uh, much of this messaging was more strategic than humanitarian, uh, designed to make sure that soldiers did not turn the local population against the army. Uh, but it also offered soldiers a wide variety of potential justifications to choose from. Taken together, this strange mixture of Nazi morality on the one hand and more traditional moral tropes that filter down to the troops helped to make it possible for soldiers of all backgrounds and ethical orientations to find a way to live with their actions and to continue functioning as effective fighters, including those who had still not fully adapted the Nazi value system. Um, so now I'll turn to individuals and give just a couple of examples of soldiers who fully imbibed Nazi morality and those who were sort of on the way there uh, in some way or another. So uh, the first example is Lance Corporal Heinz Sartorio, a former insurance salesman turned military engineer, um, who largely rationalized his side's brutality toward Eastern Europeans and Jews on the grounds of their racial inferiority. An avid supporter of Hitler and regular reader of Goebbels' newspaper Das Reich, Sartorio agreed with the propaganda minister that the Russians, quote, sometimes really seem like animals. Elsewhere, he referred to them as unintelligent and unpleasant, referring his greatest contempt for the partisans, whom he termed, quote, a group of vermin. Uh, confiding to his sister in the spring of 1942, he approvingly described the mass murder of thousands of Jews and Russians by the SS in his sector. Uh, quote, at first, one is certainly shocked by this, but when one thinks about the big idea, then one must say to oneself that it was necessary, he told her. Um, so I'll skip over a second example of uh, another man who uh, had very similar opinions. But for men like Sartorio, it appears that Nazi morality, uh, more or less by itself, provided sufficient justification for compliance or complicity. He was a man who had made considerable strides toward shedding his previous notions of right and wrong and accepting this new racially based moral system. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum were those who rarely made recourse to Nazi ideology as they sought to explain their actions to themselves and to their relatives. 
Uh, for his part, Heinz Rahe, a Protestant pastor and lieutenant with the 13th Panzer Division, favored religious justifications for the Wehrmacht's campaign in the Soviet Union. Uh, a month after the invasion began, uh, he talked about a conversation he had with some of his comrades about why they were part of this war in the first place, uh, because apparently no one had told them why they were invading the Soviet Union. Uh, Rahe rejected ideological explanations uh, quite explicitly and uh, personally decided that for him religion uh, was going to be the reason why he would fight. Um, he wrote, quote, as we then were walking by a former church, the hope grew again in me that in a free Ukraine, perhaps also Christian preaching would be possible again. This wish is also a goal for me for which it is worth fighting. Coupled with this idea that the Wehrmacht was restoring Christianity to communist lands, Rahe also hoped that the Ukraine in particular would become a free territory ruled over by a, quote, just order, even going so far as to write a poem on the subject. Uh, whenever he discussed the brutality of his own side, Heinz Rahe proffered a variety of arguments, uh, most of them based not on racial concerns, but on traditional moral tropes. Uh, for example, to explain why the Germans executed political commissars, uh, he didn't mention race or ideology. Um, he told his wife that it was happening because the commissars had, quote, killed many Ukrainians during their retreat. Um, in general, Rahe personally shied away from helping himself to civilian property and expressed sympathy for the victims of violence uh, on the part of the Wehrmacht, but he rarely intervened uh, when his men took advantage of their position of power. Um, on one occasion during retreat in 1943, when his men want, went on a particularly wild search for spoils, he explained that, quote, in general, one says to oneself that the war has its own justice. Um, he wrote that it pained him to see civilians suffer, but in the end, uh, he rationalized that his first duty as an officer was to take care of his men and make sure they could still, quote, live as well as possible during difficult times. Um, and then I, I will... Uh, skip over a few more examples of other men who uh, talked about atrocities their side committed using uh, much more sort of traditional moral arguments without resorting to ideology. Um, but uh, last, I'd like to uh, talk about a third group of soldiers who responded to the range of moral justifications presented in the Wehrmacht by selectively adopting some elements of Nazi morality and combining these with more traditional lines of moral argumentation. Uh, such a man was Private Wilhelm Moldenauser, a father of two who owned a retail store for colonial imports in a village near Hanover. Uh, Moldenauser readily accepted many of the tenets of Nazi morality, including the belief that Jews constituted a grave threat and that the invasion of the Soviet Union had been necessary to combat Bolshevism and Jewry. He was also enamored with the fantasy that ethnic Germans would one day colonize the vast regions of the East, ruling over the inferior locals with an iron hand. Uh, quote, if we want to become a great people with the requisite colonial possessions, then we still must learn a great deal from the English. This people, meaning the Russians, does better when it is handled firmly as a matter of routine, he wrote his wife. Uh, finally, like many other soldiers, he expressed astonishment at the, quote, mixed race Red Army and how much of a stout defense they were putting up. Uh, despite his apparent agreement with much of the Nazi program and its attendant revaluation of values, Moldenauser simultaneously relied on a host of other rationalizations for his or his comrades' actions. One was the persistent belief that the German army had liberated Ukrainians and other Soviet peoples from the oppression of their Bolshevik and Jewish leaders, and that the Germans were bringing them a better future, uh, bringing with them a better future for conquered peoples. Although he admitted to occasionally partaking in the theft of civilian property and exploiting civilian labor, Moldenhauser habitually insisted that he personally treated the local population very well, perhaps even too well. 
He stressed that he paid whenever he could for any items he acquired from civilians, shared food and tobacco with them, and described how his unit's doctor gave treatment to civilian patients. On another occasion, um, he even told his son to try to emulate the Russian children uh, that he saw, uh, who began working at a young age and excelled at sports. Uh, by emphasizing his own small acts of sympathy and relatively good relations with the population, Moldenhauser salved his own conscience and transmuted a brutal campaign into a mission for good and himself into a no noble warrior. Of the Ukrainians he met early in the campaign, he wrote, quote, they feel only affection and sympathy toward us Germans. And now the Germans are here, and the people can always see for themselves that the Germans are decent, nice guys. Throughout the war, Moldenhauser cycled through a wide range of rationalizations, some based on the concept of racial superiority, and others on older concepts of decency or justice to make sense of his participation in the conflict and to explain it to his family back home. He may have relied on Nazi morality to explain to himself why the enemy needed to be destroyed, but in the end, he still treasured his moral self-image as a nice guy as much as he, did it, as he did his identity as an enforcer of racial hierarchies. Um, so to conclude, I have sought in this paper to provide a glimpse into the Third Reich's moral life with the Wehrmacht as only one very small example. Um, of course, there are lots of others that would be possible. I think doctors um, come to mind as well. Um, here, as elsewhere, official discourse presented Germans not just with the singular rationale of the Nazi racial ethic to explain why certain actions were necessary, but a, di but a diverse and sometimes contradictory selection of values and arguments that could appeal to a wider swath of the public. For their part, individuals took advantage of this ambiguity uh, by deciding for themselves how best to justify their compliance without feeling pressured to immediately adopt a new value system that some did not yet find legitimate. Morally speaking, the Third Reich was a society in transition, making its way from older values to the new ones prescribed by the regime. Some arrived there quickly, but even into the 1940s, others lingered, finding it easier to resort to pre-Nazi conceptions of right and wrong. This situation may have disappointed Nazi leaders, but it ultimately worked to their benefit because it meant that even those individuals who were unwilling or unable to take the last step and embrace the revaluation of all values still found it possible to work toward the regime's goals and sleep soundly at night, secure in the illusion that they had never compromised their moral integrity. Thank you.